we are very pleased that so many people wanted to join us today and be present. And I think we might see it as a sign that the subject is very much on topic. We have lots of information to share with you, so let's get started right away. As a former Minister of Agriculture and Environment, she knows the subject far too well that will be tackled here today. And as a current member of the Committee of the Regions, she's still very much involved in everything linking to that matter. Please welcome Ms. Joke Schouvliege, thanks to whom we could have today's meeting within these settings. Thank you very much. Good morning and uh, warmly welcome here in this room, but uh, also the people who are uh, at home and uh, follow uh, us on, uh, on the screen. I uh, hope uh, everything uh, goes well and that they hear us and see us, because it was a little uh, complicated to see how we have to sit here or stay to be on the screen, but uh, when we don't hear somebody, I think it, uh, it's okay. So I'm very glad that you are all here. And as uh, a member of the Committee of the Regions, I'm uh, very happy uh, that today you will all uh, discuss on biodiversity and pollinators crisis on farmland. When the VLM asked me to be host today, I was uh, very excited. And I'm glad that uh, today we are all here. As you all know, the agri-environmental uh, schemes play a key role, a key role in helping to achieve the EU's biodiversity targets and increase uh, crop yields. But of course, they face many challenges. Based on the results and lessons learned of two North Sea region interact projects, first of all, Partridge, and secondly, Bespoke, we uh, will uh, present a set of clear suggestions and solutions on how future agri-environmental schemes should be designed to help address the European nature and yield deficits on farmland. The Patridge Interreg VB North Sea Region Programme demonstrated how biodiversity on arable farmland can be increased, while a large-scale uh, online survey provided practical answers to how to improve. And as said, when I was a Minister for Environment and Agriculture in Flanders, I could introduce this programme in my neighbourhood, and I'm very glad that uh, the farmer uh, who participated uh, is also here, and I think there are a few who will speak also uh, today. Then we also have the Bespoke uh, programme. It's also an Interact Phoebe North Sea uh, Region programme that uh, showed how levels of insect pollinators and crop uh, pollination can be increased at local and landscape scales by providing land managers and policy makers with uh, new um, tools, uh, financial knowledge and so on. And so they can create more sustainability and resilient agro uh, ecosystems. A European biodiversity strategy, I think, uh, can only work when the local and regional authorities are involved. There is a need for clear targets, but also there should be room for customization. And of course, secondly, all grants and regulation must be aligned with the strategy. On the other hand, it has to work on the field and has to be very realistic. A good involvement from the beginning of all actors and stakeholders is crucial to make it a success. I'm sure that today we will learn a lot from each other and uh, we will hear a, lot, hear a lot of experts, but also experts on the field. And I think that's, uh, that's very good and that's very interesting. I'm very sorry that I cannot stay um, a long time because I have to be in the Flemish Parliament. But uh, I wish you all a very fruitful discussion today. And I'm sure that there will be a very good report that I can uh, read or see afterwards. So thank you very much and I wish you a very good day. Thank you. Thank you very much Mrs. for the kind words and for being our host today. So, um, we will start today's meeting with a keynote brought by Ms. Anne-Sophie Müller, representative for ELO, the European Landowners Organization. Ms. Müller. Thank you. 
Thank you uh, very much and good morning, good morning also from uh, my side. I'm seeing the presentation not in presentation mode. I don't know if it's... It's on our screen. Yeah? Okay. For me it's okay. But just to make sure that's online, they can see it. So I would like to start um, with you picturing the image that I have on uh, my background. We are in an area of intensive agriculture and on the plot that you see here we have a thriving population of pollinators, we have some birds, we have small animals, and I will explain you how we get to this um, situation. I think I can manage. Can I? Yeah. But first, the bad news. Well, it's not news, because you're all very aware of it. Um, our populations are in a decline. We are seeing decline rates today that we've not seen earlier in human history. Today, as we speak, there are more than one million plant species, animal species that are threatened with, yeah, good, better like this, uh, threatened with um, extinction. And as you can see, we are in the decline, but there is a potential that we go up today. And we are making strategies today for 2030, targets 2050, 2090, but if we want to get there, it's today that we have to act yesterday. Tomorrow will be too late. And it's not only for these one, one million uh, species that we have to do it. It's really for a whole society. Biodiversity loss is a key threat for our humanity. Almost half of the global GDP is linked to nature. You can think of what happened with the COVID crisis, what happened to our markets when we had these extreme climate events, even in Belgium, uh, the huge costs that were um, linked to it. So... We really need to do something, and to do something, we need to know the drivers. And these drivers are um, linked with underlying social causes. Uh, population dynamics are consumption, trade, technological innovation, leading to habitat fragmentation, climate change, and expansion of intensive agriculture. Just to show you here, on one side, you can see what happens with more fragmentation. Um, here you can see pollinator services, but all other ecosystem services decline if we go into more fragmentation. On the other side, uh, key threats to grassland habitats, where you can see that intensive agriculture um, is, the, is the, the main pressure in almost half of the cases for biodiversity uh, decline. And here you see what happens if we have fragmentation and an expansion of intensive agriculture without taking into account biodiversity concerns. We are going from a landscape with small patches, many um, biodiversity features, into more in intensification, um, bigger plots, less features. Um, and this is uh, because we had the general economic development that were leading our way of, of doing agriculture to reduce costs, to get economies of scale and to remain competitive on the global market. And when these rates of decline become, became more visible, the European Commission started to take action. Take action by directives, by strategies. We had the Birds Directive, Habitat Directive, EU Biodiversity Strategy. We were soon voting the Restoration Law. And also the Common Agricultural Policy. There were several attempts to minimize the loss trends, but the state of play continued to go down. And I'm showing here the graph of the Farm and Bird Index because the farmland bird index give a, gives a good indication of our health, health of our farmland um, landscape. And on this graph, it's not indicated, but from 1990, we saw a 34% decline of farmland birds. To go even more into detail on the partridge, which we will also discuss today, since 1980 we have seen a 94% decline in Europe. And on the map you can see all the red dots are areas where the partridge was still present in 1980s and 2017 they were not present there anymore. Other indicator species are the pollinators, and I must say I was looking for a graph on, on the European scale to show you the decline, but it was actually hard to find. Um, so I'm using here the grassland butterfly index, which is also used as an um, indicator to show the decline of pollinators, showing 39% decline. And to come back on the economic aspect that I touched on in the beginning, we're seeing that 
the estimated value of insect pollination is estimated at 15 billion euros per year in Europe. If we, if we look at the global scale, it's estimated up to 577 billion dollars per year. Knowing then that one out of three wild bee and hoverfly species have reduced uh, compared to 1980, there is a problem. Now, going back um, to the CAP, more into detail, there has been some uh, assessments done, and I'm sharing with you four uh, outcomes that we found back. Lack of reliable indicators to assess the impact of CAP on farmland biodiversity. Lack of CAP measures to support the coexistence of agriculture with biodiversity. Not sufficient use of the available instruments. And the agro-environmental climate schemes have been insufficiently attractive. Now let me give you some nuance to these four, starting with the indicators. You can see on one side the four indicators that are used now in the new um, strategy. The impact indicators used are the farmland bird index, the crop diversity, percentage of species and habitats of related agriculture, related to agriculture with stable or increasing trends, and the percentage of agricultural land covered with landscape features. What is important for these indicators, if we want to see the impact in the whole of Europe, these indicators should be uh, usable for all the member states, all different agricultural areas or areas. Um, so we have to be aware that these index are covering all these areas and on local scale it can give some different outcomes. So we need transparency on these. Then the, so on the other side you can see the result indicators. I just added them for you. Then on the issue that CAP instruments are not uh, sufficiently available. Here we should mention also that with the new uh, CAP, they made the, the, the requirements for the cross-compliance um, more stricter for biodiversity, let's say. So for example, the GAIC 8, GAIC 9, they changed, and to give you an example, now there has to be a minimum of 4% per farm that should be non-productive area. Also, another example, the ban on, on plugging um, on Natura 2000 area permanent, permanent grasslands. So there are stricter biodiversity requirements compared to the former one. Also, the eco schemes are now uh, included. And then the two others, that the instruments are not sufficiently used, um, and that are not sufficiently measures available. I'm sure we will touch upon these in the, form, in the, in the next presentations, but just to give you some general um, aspects. Quali lack of quality and ambition on governmental level. The government should be um, able to provide farmers the possibility to, to, to implement the right set, the right set of um, schemes should be available. The stakeholders should be involved from the beginning. Transparency is needed. Flexibility is needed for the farmers. They need to feel part of it. That's the ownership feeling. The, we need sufficient um, farmer advisory services. Then financing, of course, is a very important one. Financing and bureaucracy. And the indicators that, already, that I already mentioned, together with this transparency. So advice, training, guidance, and the right set of schemes. And just to quickly add also to the later discussion, very short um, our view at the ELO on this. Conservation is only sustainable in a context of economically feasible land use. The measures should fit in an adequate business plan, but profitability must be guaranteed. The government should design effective schemes, and also the scientists should be heard on this, on, on the development of these schemes. And they should be sufficiently attractive, of course, for those who are implementing them. The farmers need to be informed in time which schemes are available and what they have to do. And for those who are not able to join in these schemes, there should be other tools available for them so they can contribute to the biodiversity targets. So coming to an end, what I also wanted to, to, to mention still to you is that I hope that, that this, this conference, this uh, discussion that we will have today is not just the discussion of today, but that you can all go home 
with the the motivations of these stakeholders, the challenges um, in mind, and that you will act with these, that you will use them further. So I still wanted to tell you, <laughs> it's okay, the last slide, so why this works, this picture, why we have here such a nice plot, that's because farmers and the hunters and the landowners were working together in dialogue, in respect with each other, in a framework that is feasible for all of them. I wish you a very good conference. Thank you, for your, Ms. Mellier, for your contribution. And I'm sure a lot of the things you mentioned already in your keynote will return during later discussions and presentations further on. Reduced crop pollination is negatively affecting yields on Europe's farms, caused by diminishing pollinators' numbers, especially bees. Agri-environmental schemes play a key role in helping to achieve the EU's biodiversity targets and increase crop yields, but they too face many challenges. Based on the results and lessons learned of two North Sea region Interact projects, Partridge and Bespoke, you will be presented with a set of clear suggestions and solutions on how future AES should be designed to help address the EU's nature and yield deficits on farmland. But before we get there, there are two special guests that want to address you. Sadly, I have to take this off for a few minutes, but I will put it back on, I, I promise. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today in beautiful Brussels. Uh, this is the Partridge and the Bespoke project, and we thought to uh, ease you into the topic a little bit, we're going to talk about partridges and bees first. No? Because I, I presume not everybody knows too much about the secret lifestyle of the partridge and the bee. And so uh, we go straight in with the presentation, if we can see it, because that is us. I think that's quite obvious. I was going to wear the full suit of the grey partridge. I have it here. It's too wet. It's too. It's too hot in here. So I'm afraid I just brought the head. Yeah. And. Let's see, uh, just the menti in the beginning, you saw it uh, for everyone online as well. Please go in, I think you had time to reach it. So we just want to know who you are and joining us today. So we will, yeah, here you have it again. You have the code uh, that you could access and you take the QR code if you want to have quick access. Please go there so we can see. And you have a first question for you to answer which organization you represent. This is for everyone in the room here and also for the people online and I would also like to welcome, of course, everybody online. I am told that we have people from all over Europe joining us here on the, on the screen. Unfortunately, we can't see you. Now, um, the grey partridge is an umbrella species and we thought we'd demonstrate to you what an umbrella species is in a minute. So I guess I have the microphone then, this because is it's... The umbrella species, okay. <laughs> and um, what does it mean, an umbrella species? Apart from the obvious, it's not raining in Brussels today. An umbrella species is a species that if you do what is good for that species, many, many other species will benefit from it. And the partridge is one of these, and maybe the best on, uh, on farmland in Europe, so whatever you do for partridges is also good for the bees, and this is what we're going to talk about now, and the birds, and the mammals, and anything you can think of that is crawling on farmland. And um, the most essential thing when we talk about partridges and bees is that we need um, a habitat all year round. We are both species that do not migrate to Africa in the winter time. And this is often forgotten. And when we talk about measures for these species, we often uh, just think about measures during the summer. But 
this is not this is not good enough. We need habitat all year round. And I can add as well that you said bees as a species, but of course bees are not only one thing. I'm a beekeeper, so honeybees are kind of what the, the animal I'm working with, but there are other bees, and this is very important to know about because we have different preferences a bit. We have different life cycles, and we're trying to show uh, in this case also what is necessary for different kind of bees. So honeybees have their beekeeper that can actually take care of them. But the wild bees, like solitary bees and bumblebees, they need <laughs> uh, us to take care of them as well, as you mentioned, with the habitat for the partridge, but also for the wild bees, of course. And we will talk about this more. Yes, we start uh, with spring. We could start any time, but it is nice and spring outside, so we thought we'd start with spring. In spring, the grey partridges, they move from the middle of the fields where they lived all winter in coveys, uh, uh, they pair up in spring and they move to the edge line habitats on farmland along hedges and grass margins and they are very, very vulnerable to this time of year to predation. And what we can do to help grey partridges in spring is to provide them with a structure where they feel safe and can uh, find food uh, in cover. And I have put up here, or we have put up here so three pictures uh, of the partridge flower mix, our main measure to show what partridge is like in the spring, and I believe they also look quite good for bees. Yes, they, are look, they are look very good for the bees. Uh, I could say for the early spring flowers, it's very important for both honeybees and the wild bees to get started in the spring. They had a good uh, start uh, with uh, collecting pollen and nectar. Uh, for the beekeeper, we can measure it for the honey content maybe, and also see the collecting of, of uh, pollen to increase uh, the size of the colony. For the wild bees, you have the queens usually, the queen bumblebee you have seen this time of year maybe. Uh, she will out searching for a nest and also find pollen for to start her uh, new colony, for example. Hedges are also very important um, during this time of the year for partridges where they find cover from predators, which we illustrated with this picture on the top right. And of course, hedges also provide uh, the bloom in the spring for many pollinators. If we then move to the nesting habitat, as you can see, this is a very busy picture. <laughs> Both species, partridge and bees, um, use all sorts of different um, habitats for nesting. For grey partridges, mostly along hedgerows where they exist. Where there is no hedgerows, they will also nest in um, uh, low input cereals um, or in partridge flower blocks. They are very good nesting sites and you can even find them sometimes at the bottom of the picture, uh, huddled away there in a pollen and nectar mix. Yeah, and for the bees then, there's a difference. If you have honeybees, you provide them with a beehive that they can live in. But for the wild bees, they need nest sites for, uh, in different um, uh, locations. For some, they need cavities like in wood or in uh, brick walls, so what they can find, or, uh, or in stones. It's uh, just a shelter or old mouse hole if you are a bumblebee. But if you, are, you also want open surface, so it should not be all be covered with vegetation. For the solitary bees, most of them actually nest in the ground, in the usually um, sandy soils, so they need these open bare um, parts as well in the landscape. It's all very complicated. Um, uh, we cannot talk about partridges without talking about predation. The grey partridge, despite being quite a big bird, lives on average only one and a half years, and that is because uh, by one and a half years, it's going to be eaten by some sort of predator. There's not many predators in Europe that don't like to eat partridges for a snack. And therefore, if we um, provide good habitat for partridges, we need to think about that and take that into consideration. And one measure um, we promote in our projects is to um, plant uh, whatever habitat is are good or meant to be for partridges in blocks rather than in um, strips because um, strips usually present a predator trap where a nest, a nesting partridge can be easily found. About 50% of nesting hen partridges fall um, uh, victim to foxes during the breeding season. Yeah, for predators, for bees then, I guess if we have more predators, it also means that we have more bees, hopefully, because they are food for the predators. So we can use the bees, they are food for others. So if we have a lot of bees, we also have food for the others to be more of them. So it kind of goes together, I would say. Otherwise, they are not hunted in that way, but of course, they are a good source for meat. 
if we then go to grassland, they're not so important for grey partridge, so I hand the microphone straight back to you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, for the grasslands, they're actually perfect sources for flowers for the bees because they need flowers from the uh, early spring to the late uh, autumn. And if you have a good moving regime and you allow uh, flowers to go through the grass and it's part of the grassland management, you also provide a lot of flowers. And we have a lot of grasslands available in Europe. So they could, instead of only having grass there, also if you add flowers, you can see a big change actually. So if you provide some nest sites and also provide food and use these areas for providing flowers for the bees, that's also very supportive uh, structure and uh, land um, plot that for the bees uh, for nesting and food source. I said they're not um, very popular uh, among partridges. That's because if a partridge happens to nest in a clover field like shown on the big picture here, it's, that is often a, a, a trap where a, a nesting partridge is being mown over by um, the mowing process of, of, that, of that meadow. If we then go to the midsummer aspect, uh, which uh, is in, when we talk about partridges, and I believe also bees is the foraging period, the grey partridges, on, um, the chicks, they depend 100% on insects during the first two weeks of their life, and therefore we, if we want to help partridges, we need to provide a habitat where the family, uh, dad and mom, they both look after the chicks, uh, can go and forage among open habitats which are full of insects. Yeah, and around midsummer and going to July, maybe, then we also usually see a kind of dip in nature with flower abundance. So it's a very good thing to actually be aware of what kind of flowers you have and what time. So if you could add flowers at this point, if there's a lack of flowers in your area, please do that, because that's very important to keep them uh, developing during the season. In late summer, uh, things start to wind down a little bit and prepare for the winter time. And uh, this is after harvest. And during this time, um, farmland becomes more and more open and more and more uh, vulnerable for partridges. And therefore, at this time, again, we talk about cover and not so much food anymore, because at this stage, partridges don't eat insects only anymore. They start to eat also green leaves and um, seeds. And um, a partridge block like here on the picture will provide um, a cover during this time of, of the year and also um, pollinator uh, food sources. Yes, and then they have, the, especially the wild bees, they are um, active at different points during the season. So some act bees are more active later in the season. So for them, it's also important with a lot of uh, pollen, especially pollen, but also nectar, to be developing in a good way. Uh, otherwise, for the ones going to nest and over winter, they also need a good pollen source, especially later at the season, because they have to build up a good fat body in their system to restrain and can be, uh, survive the winter in a good way. Yes, and then finally we come to the lovely winter, which seemed to drag on and on and on this year, in England at least. Um, and so uh, the winter season for parch is a relatively safe season. <coughs> that might be a bit contradictory, but um, or, uh, yeah, not obvious. Uh, that's because parches live in family groups. It's one of the very few birds in Europe that live uh, as a family group um, all winter time. And they usually, I mentioned it already, spend most of the daytime in the middle of fields and only flying to cover if they are being um, disturbed or attacked by, by a raptor in this case in the winter mostly. And for that, flower blocks become very important. Hedges are very important to find um, escape cover from these predators. And for the bees, they are trying to find a place to stay over winter. <clears throat> the beekeepers take care of them if they have a beekeeper doing that, but the wild bees, they need to find a site to just stay and relax during the winter and then be fit for the start in the spring. So in the early spring habitat is, as we started with, the food sources like willows, for example, and then later on dandelions, uh, they're very important sources for the bees. So these kind of weeds, uh, or may they regard them as weeds, are very important for the bees, actually. Okay, we have two more slides, I believe. Um, uh, we, we, we talked you very quickly through the different uh, seasons and uh, habitats that are needed for partridges and bees. Of course, it is now also important to remember that um, all of these habitats have to be available in a certain area 
because the range of these species is not exactly millions of miles. And so um, the diversity of these habitats in a certain area is very, very important. And this picture here illustrates that, I believe, very nicely, where you have a hedge and the grass march, and then you have a crop, then you have a conservation headland, the beetle bank, uh, a sterile strip, and the flower block, and so on and so forth, all within the same farmed uh, landscape. Yeah, and a short add to that is that, as you see the connectivity, as you mentioned, the bees also fly in different range. Honeybees can go up to three kilometers to find food sources, but for solitary bees and bumblebees mainly, they need to be much closer between the nest site and the food that is provided. So the connectivity in the landscape is very important. So what you are doing on your farm and what your neighboring farm is doing, so it's, it all goes together. So that's a very important message with the, the connectivity within the landscape. Yes, and that is, of course, also um, uh, going into the aspect of scale. It is not good if we do all these things just on one farm. It is very important that farmers work together um, in, in, in a cluster or a similar arrangement and, and, and implement these habitats across a big uh, uh, landscape. And, um, yeah, if you want to read more about uh, what we've just been talking about in partridges and bees, uh, we've put some QR codes up. There will be some more during the presentation later. Please scan them, and there you will find uh, lots and lots and lots of more info that we have no hope to cover in this short little conference today. Okay, great. Thank you very much. A quick view during the year in the life of Mrs. B and Mr. Partridge. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts, considerations, needs and hopes with us. Dear audience, after setting the scene, so to speak, I think you are all ready and eager to hear something more about these recommendations mentioned already in, in the introduction. Next up, you will receive recommendations gathered from the two projects that were co-funded by the EU Interreg North Sea Region Programme. First, we will listen to Dr. Francis Bühner, which you already met presenting Ms. as Mr. Partridge in person, head of the Partridge Project, and Ms. Fien Oost, Project Manager in the Netherlands. They will tell you more about it. Yeah, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for listening to us today, to our very important message that we have to spread today. My name is Finost. I was the project manager at the Outer Dawn demo site in the Netherlands. And Francis, of course, you've already met. We could not have done this without you, so very glad to be here together. And we are going to try and distill what we learned in seven years in these ten minutes, which is a challenge, we try. but we're up for it. Um, Next. This is me. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> sorry about it. Sorry about that. So, what we did was we had 10 demo sites spread over five countries. Uh, we had two in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Denmark, uh, and in Germany, in England, and in Scotland. And these were all 500 hectares in size. And with 12 project partners ranging from government agencies to NGOs and also farmer collectives, we worked together to try and increase farmland biodiversity in these areas. And, and uh, most importantly, to show not only the increase, but um, how we can restore farmland biodiversity generally. And I just wanted to, because we have no time to mention all these different organizations that uh, work in the Partage project. It's a big project with 12 partners, Finn was saying it. Please, if you could all stand up from the Partage project so we can see that half of the room is the Partage project. <laughs> Partage project, please. So you yes, see, these are all the partners of the yeah. Partage project. It's a big project. You can sit down again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. Um, why Partridge? We heard it already in the introductory speech, um, and you even see, saw that graph before. I knew that. That is on purpose. It doesn't hurt to remind ourselves how bad it is when we talk about uh, farm and biodiversity. I think it is 5 to 12, hence the alarm bell there. Uh, a good indicator are the farm and birds, simply because we know so much about them. They continue to decline, despite all the good work of the Commission, and I hope 
some of them are in here and will listen to us, the biodiversity uh, strategy 2020 and our targets on 2030, the birds and habitats directives, they're all very good documents, but somehow, and the cap and the greening, but somehow these things just don't make it into practice. And so these birds continue to decline. One, 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 one back. You're too quick. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so one of these farmland birds is the grey partridge, and the grey partridge is um, the one bird that has declined the most, 94%. That is millions and millions of partridges that have disappeared from the landscape. And uh, we mentioned it before, the great partridge is an umbrella species. I spare you the umbrella, you got the point. Uh, so what we, if we do what is right for the great partridge, we do what is right for farm and biodiversity. Yes. So how do you actually help this bird that needs it so very, very much? And why did we choose the partridge? Well, the reason for that is that the partridge is one of the most well-researched birds that we have in Europe. There's been so much research done that we could take what we learned from all of these projects all over Europe and put it in this wonderful booklet that you can scan the QR code for. Uh, as Francis already mentioned, there will be a lot of QR codes during this presentation, so please scan them and then read them afterwards. Um, this, the partridge... Uh, needs all this practical experience to be able to um, uh, thrive. And we did that by developing this nature recovery toolbox that you can see wonderfully demonstrated on your screens here. And what we learned was not only that you need the ecology to do right by this bird, but you also really, really need the human aspect. You already saw all of our partners stand up, but if everybody that was... Uh, active in the Partridge Project was in this room, it would be far, far too small. Uh, and that was a very important thing also that we learned throughout these seven years. And this nature recovery toolbox, um, well... was built on one main building block, and that was, the, that was the Partridge flower block. Why did we choose the Partridge flower block? There is, of course, many, many more habitats, and we shall mention very briefly, uh -huh. but we can't, uh, you know, um, change the world in just an interreg project, so we had to focus on one, and it was Partridge block because we believe, be, first, because it is a year-round habitat, it lasts for five to six or even ten years if it's planted well, if it includes all these flowers you can see of this picture, and therefore it represents good value uh, for money. And it's not only good for partridges, because the partridges and umbrella species is also very good for farm and biodiversity generally. So what you see in this slide here are the reference sites that we had, because every demo site that we had also had a reference site. And this is what the average European farmland actually looks like. So you can see a little bit of color, which is the wildlife-friendly habitat, but you can also see that this is not a very wildlife-friendly landscape. And this is what... Um, most of Europe looks like. And then the demo sites. And you can immediately see the massive difference between before and this, uh, this slide. Because you can see here the mosaic of many different colors, of many different measures that we took in order to increase our wildlife. Um, and we were able to do this only because we had very good relationship with the people on the ground, which is very, very important. You need to inspire farmers to try and take this on. Because it was something, let me tell you. And this is one of the only graphs that we are going to show. This is the demonstration site versus the reference site of the average wildlife-friendly habitat that was in these sites. Of course, the demonstration sites already had a little bit higher AES scheme uptake, but we increased it with an average of 4.5%, whereas throughout the entire period of the project, the reference sites only increased by 0.5% under the current cap. So that is something to keep in mind. Yeah, and that brings us to the uh, main result that we want to share with you, of course. Um, we did a lot of monitoring to try and prove uh, that our measures that we talked about over seven years really work. We, 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 um, we uh, um, monitored several indicators from farmland birds to hares to grey partridges to habitat. And uh, the one indicator that um, delivered the, the best, so to speak, and we walked uh, the equivalent from Brussels to Baghdad <laughs> to count all these birds on our, uh, it's true. Um, I mean, not physically, but you know, the distance, you get it. Uh, it's a long, it's, it was a major work. And what did this data show us? It showed us that the number and the diversity of farmland birds at our 10 demo sites is significantly higher um, than our um, reference sites. And so is, if you just saw it on these maps, the, the habitat availability and therefore um, the, the habitat the flower-rich habitat. 
Oh, and so, um, yeah, if, yes, you. one, yes, we want to see the tunnel, we want to see the end of the tunnel. So how can we restore farmland biodiversity? That is the big question here today, to an extent that delivers the recovery of farm and wildlife that we all want, that are embedded in these um, biodiversity targets, which we just don't seem to reach whenever we uh, come up in a, in a new decade. And therefore now we have listed a few uh, main recommendations from the experience of the Great Partage Project based on this result that I've just shared. And these are the ones that we believe you must address if you are a policy maker. So off we go. Off we go. So I just mentioned it already, but what we learned very, very early on is that you cannot do this alone. You need everybody who is on the ground, who knows the area, to work with, along with you, and you need to build relationships based on trust. That is one of the most important things, the people aspect of such a project. You need the volunteers, you need the people who live in the area, you need the farmers, you need the policy makers. And if you can manage it, involve also your local and regional and even national authorities. So that is point number one. Secondly, and it was already briefly um, mentioned by uh, the speaker here before, you need to improve the advice that the farmers receive about this uptake of AES schemes because it is not easy and it takes a lot of advice continuously throughout the year, throughout, this entire, um, uh, throughout the entire scheme to make sure that the farmers know what they have to do and know what they are up to. And also you need advisors and field coordinators who have plenty of hours, plenty of time, um, to actually go out and organize field walks and take people out to showcase what we are doing on this uh, farmland. So this is, uh, this is a good picture. You can see here on the left-hand side, it's Laurent. He's going to be in the panel a little later on. Um, he was a, a farmer in Isabellepolder. And uh, one of the points that we would like to also make is that you need a certain, kind of f a certain amount of flexibility in your AES scheme because otherwise you just run into rules and regulations that are not workable for the farmer. And unfortunately, one of the results that you can have is this beautiful flower block that you see in the middle picture, which is no longer there because of the inflexibility in rules and regulations, which can sometimes just lead to farmers not taking up the AES anymore. Just leave that for a moment yep. slide. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see a document that we have uh, published. It is uh, recommendations uh, how to improve the agri environment scheme and scale it up. And that is based on a large-scale um, online survey that we did. And if you want to uh, read about all the details, we have some copies outside, if there is some left. And, um, uh, and, and you can also download it from our webpage. There is some QR codes here somewhere hidden away Thank in the presentation. Yeah. So uh, next yeah. one. So. Um, we spoke about the human aspect of bringing about the, um, uh, the reversal of, of farmland uh, to increase farmland biodiversity. Now we want to talk about the wildlife. Um, in order to be successful, we really, really uh, recommend that we scale up our approach across bigger landscapes. We've done it with 500 hectares. That's just because uh, we felt at the beginning of the project uh, bigger is not possible. It's not feasible as part of an interact project, but we highly recommend that you scale this up hundredfold. We need to have 5,000, 50,000 hectares, which look like this, where we have uh, for you visually here, <laughs> put together all, all the, the demo, demo sites. sites in one big block. If all farmland looked like that in Europe, we wouldn't have a biodiversity crisis. Uh, the next slide, please. And of course, um, all these... Uh, colorful blocks that we just saw on this big scale, they have to be of very high quality and we need to have enough of them. It's not good enough to have just 3 or 4 or 5 percent. We need 10 percent and this has been shown scientifically in a recent publication here, also shown on the screen by the RSPB and we full heartedly uh, uh, support uh, this approach. If we go land less than 10 percent in our experience, it will not work. And then uh, uh, finally we have to improve the quality of these measures that we offer to the farmers and we need to have more of them. Um, we have summarized this again in, in this publication that I've just mentioned before, the 10 uh, most important um, agri environment scheme measures to recover farm and biodiversity as you can see on the right hand side here and you saw this uh, infographic here uh, already before also. These habitats need to be available in the same landscape. It's not good to have a farmer who has just one beetle bank here and another one has a flower block there. Every farmer needs to have a beetle bank, a flower block, and a grass margin and a hedge. And lastly. 
And, um, and the last thing is a summary of our communication activities. And we thought we'd give you the opportunity while you read this um, to ask some questions, if you have some yes, questions. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, half of this stage is Otherwise Spanish we people, have lunch so... <laughs> and nice informal question and answers uh, during the lunch, but that's not very productive for the people on screen. Sorry, people on screen. But the room is very quiet. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francis and Fien. I think you've given the audience that much information, they're still digesting it. Uh, so perhaps you will have some uh, answers during uh, lunch. After the recommendations for the, from the Partridge project, we will now hear what the Bespoke team has to teach us. I give you Professor John Holland, head of the Bespoke project, and Dr. Michelle Fountain, project manager in England. Uh, so good morning and, and uh, thank you very much for attending uh, the meeting today and uh, to learn about our new projects. So for the Bespoke project, we're just, like Partridge, we're going to uh, present some key outputs and some recommendations from the project. Uh, it's quite a complicated project with lots of different elements, so uh, we can't cover everything uh, today, but we can uh, give you it all on, uh, available online, so please have a look at our website, which has got lots of different information on there. And there are some booklets and outputs uh, outside on the desk, so please feel free to take some of those away. I'll be very glad because they're very heavy and I don't want to <laughs> take them home. So the, the overall aim of the Partridge project really is to try to have the bespoke project. <laughs> I've had um, <laughs> lots, lots of... Uh, it's to try and enhance and improve the resources for pollinators, which were shown to be in decline. And uh, we focused mostly on fruit crops, uh, some arable crops, and, and also grassland environments, uh, as these offer some uh, opportunities, uh, both for biodiversity and for the uh, land managers. So we've heard some of the things about the key drivers. So crop pollination, well, that's been estimated to, yeah, at 15 billion across the EU per, per annum. Uh, we don't know the Pacific values for the North Sea region, uh, there are some for individual countries, but it's a considerable sum of money uh, uh, at the moment. But pollinators are in decline, and this is despite having you know, good agro-environment measures from, for several decades in most um, member states. So we're not getting it right, is, is the message. Uh, and crop pollination has a, a big impact on both on crop yields, but also on the quality of, of some of these crops. Uh, but it's not really regarded as a priority by the land managers. And that could be because uh, there are sufficient pollinators at present. Sometimes they're supplemented with the honeybees, so there's the precautionary approach. But also, they're not routinely measuring pollination. And, uh, and so we don't really know if it's, if, if it's going down or up, if it's adequate, and there could be gaps there. And so that's one of the aims of the project. And so we had lots of different actions to uh, develop new expertise, knowledge and tools for the land managers uh, to increase pollinators and, and crop pollination. And this involved developing some new wildflower mixes targeted at the types of pollinators needed by the different crops. Different crops need different types. So, for example, honey needs a different, uh, apples need a different type of uh, pollinators to, to uh, soft fruit. Uh, we developed some new predictive software, so trying to address these issues of land management and identify how much is needed and, and where, and the types of habitats as well. Uh, and those will be uh, demonstrated during the, during the lunchtime. Um, we also have uh, set up demo sites and uh, developed a lot of training materials. And finally, we also wanted to understand more about land managers, their attitudes to uh, pollination, to how they're using agri-environment schemes, and also delved a little bit into the economics of, of supporting pollinators as well. So the, uh, the Bespoke project had um, seven North Sea region countries involved in it, and we had 18 
partners, and that included scientists, seed companies, and also advisors. And I think as Francis asked the Partridge people to stand up, please can I ask the bespoke people to stand up to make it fair? So we have a lot of the contributors to that project here so that you can identify them and ask them questions during the break. So first of all about the seed mixes. So uh, we developed some, a range of targeted seed mixes, so designed to support the types of pollinators needed by the crops. Uh, we established those on demo, demo sites and then we went about measuring uh, how well they established because it can be quite challenging to get some of these seed mixes growing. Uh, we also monitored uptake, uh, so whether the pollinators were using the mixes and in some cases we looked also whether having an impact on crop pollination or not. If you want to know more about that, then there are, we have uh, lots on the website. There's an online magazine that's got some of the results, and there'll be another one out, out soon. So during the project, we actually established over 300 new wildflower sites, and these were used as demonstration for training and for farmer events. Um, we also reached over 150,000 people, so I think that shows the interest in the agricultural industry, both in um, pollination and providing that through wild pollinators. So in terms of farmer attitudes, so we conducted a survey to really try and find out what they were thinking. So many of them had already had experiences of trying to encourage pollinators, and this was mostly for conservation purposes and less so for uh, economic gain. Um, we also uh, learnt a lot about how, how they'd managed those habitats uh, and what they were using that information for. And really the drivers were, were much more for just <coughs> conservation rather than for... Uh, improving their crop yields. So we think there's some opportunities there as well. Uh, and we also wanted to know a little bit more about the constraints that they're under and what they might do in the future. And so, th and this is being prepared in, into a report which should, should be available relatively soon. And one of, one of the key things that we did through the Bespoke Project was we measured the strengths and the weaknesses of each country's um, agri-environment schemes. And this is uh, really important because we analysed the data and we used that data in combination with the findings from the Bespoke Project. And we have produced a list of recommendations for um, policy makers. They're available at the meeting here and also available on our website. Um, uh, bespoke NSR. So as part of the project we also uh, looked at uh, developing these demo sites and ran lots of training events. We know that farmers prefer to learn from in-field, uh, in-person events and learn from their peers as well and so that was a, these were conducted in all of the uh, NSR countries. Uh, we've also developed a range of outputs for the farmers, so there's 10 guides and uh, over 30 videos uh, to, to help them and leave a, a legacy for the project. So do have a look at those online uh, and, and promote them as much as possible. And as we mentioned before, two tools were developed for the project. So these are predictive tools. So the first one is to quantify bee habitat, both at the farm scale and at the land, land scale. Um, oh, I think, our, I think our battery might have run out. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll sp speak loudly so hopefully you can hear me. So um, the first model was to predict the amount of bee, quality bee habitat you have both at the landscape scale and at the uh, farm scale and then model was to um, help farmers realise the added value that putting extra wildflower habitat into their farms would give them in terms of the diversity and numbers of pollinators. There's no point in that. Is there? It's off. <laughs> yeah, it's on, but it's not working. Okay. So we've developed a, a range of online resources. So you please have a look at those, uh, all the different various leaflets. Uh, and also the, the uh, predictive tool will be made available online. So if we see that really as a, as a tool for policymakers, but it also could be for advisors. 
And the advantage of having these sorts of online tools is the, f the farmers can go into that uh, and try and identify the amount of habitat that they may need to boost their levels of pollinators. Uh, because that's always a question that is asked, is, well, how much do I need? Uh, and if they've already got some existing habitats and, and uh, that are providing resources for, for pollinators, then maybe they don't need to, to go to such a high level and they can just supplement it where needed. And also, the spatial distribution of these insects is also important, as we've understood already with, with partridges, you need to have these resources scattered sufficiently in the landscape so that they can uh, reach all of the areas that, that you may want to, to have pollinated. Uh, and as crops are rotated, or if they're perennial crops, then you need different strategies for that. And also you need to make sure they've got all these nesting habitats as well. And some of these insects uh, don't fly too far. Solar bees may only go 100 metres from the nest, whereas a bumblebee can go several kilometres. So again, you have to take into account the, uh, the size of the insect and the type of pollinators needed by the crop and, and how far they might uh, travel. So you can see that the outputs from this project are really wide-reaching. So they stem right from the farmers who are putting the wildflowers into place through to the advisors who are obviously advising them on how to do it and the tools that they will need, and right through to influencing um, governments and the policies that they produce. So now what we'd like to um, briefly present are the seven key recommendations from the Bespoke project. So in terms of seed mixes, we developed a, a variety of different seed mixes. And uh, this is because the current mixes that are available to farmers are mostly a generic mix. Uh, it has a limited number of, of common species in it. And it's not really delivering in terms of supporting the diversity of bees that we need for uh, to, to pollinate all of the different crop types. Uh, and we've also developed these for, for fruit crops, so for soft fruit and top fruit and for grassland. Uh, and there are, are opportunities there. Uh, grassland in particular is a, can be quite a sterile environment and putting in some extra flowering habitat can have a huge impact in the landscape. And by doing that, uh, you need to less, take less land out of production. And uh, you can also have a very productive uh, grass fields without, without being just pure monocultures of ryegrass or with clover. And one of, one of the other key messages or recommendations from the project, um, and some countries are already doing this, but not all of them, is that the seed that is sourced is locally sourced. So locally produced, developing businesses in the, in the local area, but also um, planted nearby. And the reasons for that are um, reasonably obvious, that that seed is better adapted to that location, to the weather, to the soil conditions, as we've already mentioned. Um, and so... If we can put seed mixes in that are more uh, adapted to those areas, they're more likely to be successful and more likely to be
be a gain in the long term or not. And one, one of the key findings was that the current agri um, environment schemes are just not flexible enough. Um, they don't give farmers good ownership over what they're doing. So farmers need to be able to have to be able to decide where to put the seed and what seed they're growing. So I work with a fruit grower, for example, who's developed his own seed mixes. He's not using the agri-environmental schemes to do that because he knows what flowers grow best in his area. So by giving them a little bit more control over where and what they put in, they develop their own interest. Um, and also, it's, all, it's, it's, a, it's about budget as well, what equipment different farmers have. So fruit farmers will have different equipment to arable farmers, and so they will um, set up wildflower areas in different ways. It needs to be more flexible, and it needs to be suitable for all farmers and growers. I think it's working. So pollinators are, are quite simple, really, in terms of trying to encourage them. Uh, some of the, the two key things they need, really, are an abundance of flowers, so fish and floral resources, and also a diversity of plants, as diversity of plants is linked directly to the diversity of, of pollinators that you get. Um, and so if we can create sort of really high-quality habitats with a high density of flowers, there's an opportunity there, then, to reduce the amount of land taken out of production. But that relies on the farmers having the skills and the expertise to, to establish and maintain those habitats. So uh, this, is, this is a really important point. And when we look at uh, different habitats in agri-environment schemes, we've uh, studied them, we find that many are quite inadequate and not really meeting the expectations that you might expect. Uh, and so there's opportunities there to, to improve the quality of, of these habitats and deliver more resources for the bees. So we recommend that um, the floral resources on the farms span from March right through to October. And that doesn't have to just include uh, sown floral areas. That can be flower-rich grasslands, hedgerows, and also woodland habitats. Um, this will not only give you uh, benefits in pollination and pollinators, but also more natural pest control. So you'll be increasing the number of natural enemies and predators, for example. Um, it will give you more biodiversity gains and also added social value. And as, as with Partridge, we've, uh, we believe that farmers need more advice. They, uh, they're very skilled at growing crops, but not always at producing these wildflower habitats. And we think they, the, the approach that farmers take often depends on their philosophy, uh, their interest, uh, and there are some, uh, some which are fantastic and do everything properly, but there are others that perhaps fall lag behind. Uh, and we think that, as has been mentioned before, that we, they need to take own, ownership of this. Uh, and so we need a bottom, more of a bottom-up approach. And I think providing free on-farm advice is, is a key thing. But those advisors also need to be very skilled, so they need to understand... Uh, uh, biodiversity and the requirements of biodiversity. They need to send a little bit about agronomy as well and how to manage and establish those habitats. But they also need to understand farmers and the constraints that they're under. Uh, at the moment, they often receive advice from a whole plethora of different organisations and uh, bringing that down to perhaps fewer but more well-informed advisors could greatly help. And when you look at the expenditure in the CAP, uh, IEEP did a report and uh, training comes out as actually one of the lowest uh, funding streams uh, from the CEP. And I think we should really look at that because I think it could add extra value for money uh, in terms of the creation of better, better quality habitats. And we do have some great agri-environment schemes out there with many different options, many different measures, but they're just not being used in the right way. Uh, and putting, putting them together as packages can also help. So in the, in the UK scheme, uh, a farmer can go into a pollinator or farmland bird package, uh, and then he has to have all the resources that are needed by that group are, are given in that package. And so that's, that overcomes one of the problems of the farmers just picking and choosing the things that work best within their own farming systems. So you can see that the Bespoke project goes a long way to providing tools, giving advice and giving recommendations both well, from the farmer, from the farm advisors and through to policy. And this all goes towards helping us achieve more sustainable farming. 
I think over the overall message is that we need to increase plant diversity on farms. We need to um, increase the, the amount, amount of floral resource for pollinators and for other insects. And that will hopefully give us more resilient agricultural ecosystems um, going into the future and including um, challenges such as climate change. Um, thank you for listening and uh, we'll take any questions now and we'll be around at lunchtime as well to take Yeah, I just want to ask because um, it's very interesting. Did Sorry. Uh, the question is, did you compare the seed mixes and approach with the Patridge one? Because I think it's all about the same, more or less, uh, but a bit different approach. If you um, work together, it might be better. But the only thing I would say is that the partridge mix will be supporting pollinators, uh, but we shouldn't be just putting one mix across the landscape because we need to increase plant diversity and they need to be tailored to the locality. So for soil type, for example, you need a different seed mixes, whether it's a heavy soil, a light soil. And so one, not one size fits all. And, that, and that's a key thing that we, we do have to do. Uh, and that's a problem at the moment because a lot of the uh, seed companies are all producing the same similar types of mixes and, and they need to be much more tailored. And so that goes back down to the advice provided by the seed companies and the advisors about the types of mixes that they need. And if, if I can just add to that, we're also um, in the Bespoke project, we're developing seed mix, mixes which are specific to specific crops. So, for example, we've developed a seed mix for strawberry growing, which encourages the particular pollinators that visit strawberries. It, it also encourages the natural enemies, which will feed on aphids and thrips and that kind of thing. But it deletes the flowers out of the seed mix that might also be a source of pests and diseases for that crop. So one thing that might put a farmer or grower off putting a, a wildflower seed mix in is if that is a source of pests into the crop. So by identifying which flower species are beneficial and not de detrimental, we can really start to tailor the landscape to not only benefit insects and biodiversity, but also benefit the crop. And if the grower is getting added value from that as well, it, it will encourage that uptake. Sorry. In your key recommendations, you are thinking to also include the use of pesticides because, I mean, the farmers can use whatever seeds uh, uh, you are advising them, but as long as they are using high level of pesticides in their parcels, I mean, this can also have like a very damaging um, effect on pollinators. Crops are going to need some protection at some times in the year from pests and diseases. Um, so obviously if you're putting in wildflower areas, the timing and the buffer zones are all really important. So we don't want, especially for example, insecticides drifting into these wildflower areas. So we have got some recommendations in our document on that and how to achieve that. And John, I don't know if you have any extra comments. Yeah, I mean some of these wild Habitats are also going to be invaded by its less desirable uh, plant species, noxious weeds. And so um, if they're starting to threaten the crop production, then the farmers aren't going to be too happy. So I think that there needs to be some flexibility. Uh, and that's where I think having a, an advisor working closely with the farmer could, could overcome some of that and, and give the uh, permission or not to actually control those weeds if they start to dominate in a, in a wildflower habitat. But of course, many of those weeds are also really good pollen for pollinators. Thistles, for example, are just uh, loved by wild, wild bees. So uh, we're not always so worried if they start to, to take over a plot. But if, then if they start to spread too much, we don't want it to be just become a monoculture of, of one particular weed. Mm -hmm. So I think we do need to have some, still have some opportunities in there. And also, the, the farmers themselves, if they think that they can't control any of the weeds in these habitats, that, that's a big disincentive to go into the schemes uh, and uh, you know so there's a farmer here today he might want to uh, 
show some uh, interest in that and ex expressive views if we've got time. So um, for the moment, we are also participating in the projects. We stop with the Patrick project, but we continue with the Bespoke project. So it's very important that for the farmer, it has also a profit. We don't make something on the field that has a, is a growing place for bats, plants, bats, uh, insects. Uh, I think we must be a little bit aware that we must combine everything, make the farmers sensible about what they use. We already started to use good products, better products, product, products who are selective, so they uh, leave the good insects and the bad insects, they will be damaged. Uh, I think, yeah, the, the farmer must be also, yeah. Be aware, that's the only big problem that you have at the moment. Uh, we need to have profit on our fields. We have low payments for our feeding that we need, uh, that we make on the field. So if that will be higher, the farmer will be also a bit more flexible and say, ah, I will maybe participate in a project like this and maybe use other products for uh, saving the good insects or uh, leaving a lot of spot on the field for biodiversity. So it's a little bit of combination that I think uh, for the moment. And yeah, it's a lot of things who are connected to each other to bring a good result in the, in the, in the future. I, I have a, a, just a comment or a question, sorry, I, I don't speak English very well, but I have not heard uh, talking about the common agricultural policy so far, so I would like to, to know about your opinion about this, this big problem, I think it's the biggest problem we have already, and how is the way we can fight against, against this problem that is causing the, the loss of biodiversity in all Europe? Yeah, but for example, the agriculture, the common agriculture policy is, is allowing to the farmers to do whatever they want to do, to take more profit for, from the fields. For example, in Spain, there are many endangered species and we are working with them, but the, the farmers doesn't want to, to collaborate with us because they are taking more profit doing what they want. So they are taking more money and they, they don't care about the endangered species because the, the, agric the common agriculture policy allow them to use all of that kind of produce to change the, the, the crops, the use of the crops, and everything is legal. If we don't change that, we, are not, we cannot do anything real and very good for the species at the end. 
So we need to, to work harder. It's a very good job what you are doing nowadays, but we need to, to, to work uh, bigger to, to try to change these this, this laws that are and ruin our biodiversity. What do you think? from a very tidy, sterile like area into a really annoying area to go and assess biodiversity because there are now so many insects in those orchards. He doesn't cut the alleyways until harvest. He lets nettles grow up the alleyways. He puts wildflower mixes in. And there are so many insects in those orchards now that to actually, you could, you could do a bio blitz in those orchards. They're so good. But it took that, it took a really big, leap of faith for him and he had a loss in profit for a year or two afterwards um, for him to take that step and now other farmers are going to to his orchards looking at what he's done and I've I, I went I walked some orchards a couple of weeks ago and I've, I've seen pear orchards now with nettles growing up the alleyways and it, that's just great so they're learning from um, someone who's really taking a, a, faith, a leap of faith forward and then implementing it. So I think that's what you need. You probably need to find um, a farmer who's going to come on board with you and demonstrate and then get your other farmers in to see what he's doing or what they are doing. Yeah. They need to. They need to. They need to. Sorry. I'm talking too much, maybe. <laughs> okay. No problem. Um, I s should say we tried to get... Francis, you wanted to say Five something? <laughs> well, that will be a bit short for everyone to do, grab a coffee, but uh, let's say we try to manage to get back here about, uh, in about 10 minutes so that we can restart again about 11.30. Thank you for listening so much and see you again soon.
Yeah, and I noticed that. Uh, yeah, well, I had the impression too that it gave some noise, but uh, this one wasn't working any. Yeah. She said that it's, it's, if you look at the working load, when you have most working load with the beehives, it might be the same period of year when you have to do harvesting in the orchard. So do you have that situation too, that you feel that it's the same time of year that the bees work? Yes, the boxes beginning to... 
this thing to break. Yeah, yeah. Take what a look can of we do? I think it's actually so quite fine to transfer. No, it's a little bit in between, but it's high. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
micro allumé. Il reste allumé. C'est parce qu'en fait, il n'y a personne d'autre qui prend la parole. Est-ce qu'il est le C'est aussi indépendant du micro Donc ils peuvent parler ensemble en fait. Un, deux. Un, deux. Par contre, je euh, peux rester allumé tout le temps. Euh, parce que personne ne parle en salle en fait. Et si ils sont vraiment comme toi et moi l'un à côté de l'autre, on va laisser on, tu vois. Et puis ensuite. Je pense pas qu'il y aura 10 000 micros, enfin 100 micros en même temps. Tu vois, comme tu vois. Like this. When you are finished speaking,
Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> it's the first one, the first time I'm sitting on a president's seat. <laughs> it has more buttons. <laughs> so, so uh, Good morning again. I hope everyone's back online as well and here in this room for the second part of this event. Um, second part is a panel interview and I would suggest that everyone in the panel presents itself to the audience by telling us your name and the organization of stakeholders you represent and tell us in a few words why you took part in one or both of the projects uh, or why you thought it relevant to be here with us today as you didn't were a member of the project. Perhaps we can start on my right hand with Marie. Okay, uh, thank you very much and good morning from my side. Uh, my name is Marina Hacigianni. I am working in the European Commission in the Directorate General for Agriculture and Rural Development. And more specifically, I'm a policy officer in the Environmental Sustainability Unit. I'm working more closely with some biodiversity aspects, um, pollinators, organic farming, and genetic resources. And I was actually involved very much in the assessment of the Kaplans, uh, uh, which have been adopted and have been running since uh, January. Uh, the reason I am here is because I wanted to see Francis costume <laughs> but okay jokes aside i think it's really uh, important that uh, we have this kind of exchange i mean we are often accused that we are in our offices in brussels and we don't listen to the people who are actually working in the ground so i think it's really important that we are here we listen to you we understand on your research findings, and then we try actually to transmit this in our policy making processes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is David Scallon. I am the Secretary General of FACE, which is the European Federation for Hunting and Conservation. Um, we represent Europe's seven million hunters and are members of the national hunting associations in 36 countries. So our main interest is um, really in terms of farmland biodiversity. We have a big biodiversity problem and we have been very interested in the work of the Partridge Project and how to make these results uh, deliver at the right scale uh, in terms of policy here in Brussels and on the ground. So my name is Lotta Fabricius Christiansen and we met before and as I said then I'm a beekeeper but so that's why I'm in the panel today but I'm also employed at the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences uh, and we have been part of the Beesbook project uh, and for my uh, personal also interest uh, I'm initiator of something called Pollinate Sweden and we work with trying to raise or uh, awareness about pollinators and their needs in general uh, so that's kind of my interest being here as well. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Andrea Kuiper, and I uh, work for BirdLife Netherlands. I'm uh, head of the team that works on farmland birds in agriculture. And we're part of the Partridge Project in the Netherlands. Um, and we're, um, we joined the Partridge Project because we wanted to be a part of the solution. So we wanted to work with all the relevant stakeholders. Uh, to um, uh, work on biodiversity uh, restoration in, in, in the concrete area. And I think it's important that we're here uh, to share the lessons we've learned and, well, to, um, um, well, make sure that we, um, uh, the, the important lessons are, um, well, lent in policy and increase uptake and so we can restore biodiversity on a much larger scale. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Magnus Jung. I'm at, also at the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. I'm heading the uh, National Competence Center for Advisory Services. And that means that our organization supports Swedish advisors within uh, agriculture, forestry and horticulture, landscape and management uh, in general. 
especially when it comes to the development of new methods and approaches. And I was part of the uh, Bespoke project where we especially looked at the and evaluated, one can say, the methods we developed within the Bespoke project. So we had some kind of internal process too, to learn from our own experiences and that what was we were mainly doing. But in general, one can say that I'm, I'm very interested in these issues that we so far already had discussed about the implementation gap. You know, how to be more successful in scaling up and out of these uh, amazing ideas and measures that has been suggested both in Partridge and the Bespoke project. So how to bridge the implementation gap is my key question in my own research. So my name is Laura Hovart. Um, I'm the eighth generation farmer on our farm. And we joined the project in 2016. We already do nature implement implementation since 2002. And, um, we are all the time busy with uh, implementations on different uh, sites. Um, we are the people from the field, so where the project is managed, uh, everybody is partner in the project, but it is on the field, then it needs to be uh, yeah, successful. So we are the part of the project who must make it happen on the field. Uh, and also for us, it needs to be possible as farmer to, uh, yeah, manage it still in the future. Uh, how are we going to do it in the future? Can we do still the things that we are doing now at the moment? Uh, restrictions, uh, future uh, view, how we will, um, yeah, we, we need to change some things uh, to provide a better biodiversity. So for us, it's very important that we can uh, yeah, participate still in the project. We stop with the Patrick project at the moment but we continue with the Bespoke project. But we are still uh, yeah, uh, connected to the Patri project. Uh, and maybe in the future we can do something next to the, the farm, something more near to the farm. Yeah. Dear panelists, thank you for re uh, representing yourself, presenting yourself to the audience. Um, I will direct my first question to Ms. Adjiani. Um, could you explain to us what is the role of the new CAP for biodiversity conservation and protection of pollinators? Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I think we all admit that uh, biodiversity and climate crisis are really threatening our agriculture, but also our food production. Um, we can see the daily effects, for example, of floods and droughts, but also on the pollinator decline, where one out of three of the pollinator species are under extinction. And that's exactly why we know that biodiversity <coughs> conservation and nature restoration are really key priorities for the common agricultural policy, because if we want to continue producing our food, we really need to bring back nature to agriculture. Uh, the common agricultural policy of 2023 is governed by nine specific objectives. We have three objectives on the economic sustainability three objectives on the environmental and climate sustainability, and three objectives on the social sustainability. When it comes to the environmental sustainability, we have one specific objective, which is on uh, the halting and the reversing of biodiversity loss, enhancing ecosystem services, and preserving habitats and landscapes. So uh, the member states had to design interventions or schemes that they will be offering to the farmers and to the other beneficiaries and explain how they will be achieving these objectives. Um, the new CAP is also governed by what we say the green architecture. So it means that we have really given a lot of priority to uh, making our uh, CAP policy greener. And the three elements that are governing this architecture are the following. The first one is all of the conditions that all beneficiaries of the CAP have to fulfill. 
These are called the Good Agricultural and Environmental Conditions, the GAECs, where every beneficiary that is receiving area or animal-based payment has to comply with. Uh, more specifically on the biodiversity, we have two of these obligatory conditions which are relevant. The first one is uh, the obligation to reserve 4% of the arable land for biodiversity purposes, and this has to be fulfilled, as I said, by all the beneficiaries. Uh, the second obligation concerns of setting up fertilizer-free and pesticide-free um, buffer streets in the, in, the, in the different parcels. Uh, the second element of this architecture is about the eco-schemes. The eco-schemes are really new measures which are paid under the first pillar, the, the direct payments envelope of the CAP, and uh, is offering the farmers and the, and the uh, different possibilities to um, subscribe into annual schemes on environmental practices. And member states, again, have a lot of flexibility on how to design these eco-schemes. At the same time, it's different from the rural development uh, interventions because they are on an annual basis. And this actually gives the flexibility to the farmer to try it out, and if it doesn't work, to uh, stop it on the following year. On the eco-schemes, uh, member states have to reserve 25% of their direct payments uh, envelope. So you can see this is really an application and we, we really want the member states to be uh, planning these kind of eco-schemes. Then uh, we also continue in the new CAP with uh, agri-environmental climate commitments, organic farming and the Natura 2000 payments. And here the member states have to reserve 35% of their rural development fund for these uh, interventions. As you can understand from what I'm saying, we really have all the instruments in place to incentivize the farmers to uh, carry out environmental practices. We really try with the member states to see uh, the right, I would say, financial contribution in order indeed to encourage the farmers to um, transition towards more uh, sustainable agriculture. Uh, also, under the rural development, we also have the possibility for the non-productive investments, which can actually help to create uh, landscape features, which can be really uh, significant fitting areas for pollinators. Uh, we also have the advisory services, but also training. Um, well, just also to mention that uh, recently we have adopted our uh, communication on the revision of the Pollinators Initiative. And there we have 42 actions that are addressing both the Member States but also the Commission. So we have an action plan on how to uh, actually um, reverse the decline of the pollinators. And when it comes to the agriculture, we have four specific actions which are linked to us. And one of them is really to encourage more uh, pollinator-friendly interventions and also discuss with the member states to identify which practices can really be beneficial for the protection of the pollinators. Uh, so to conclude, I think that the new CAP is really much in line with the biodiversity strategy. We really have the tools and the instruments in place. Uh, we want to, as I say, continue this exchange and dialogue also with you, uh, and we want to encourage uh, our farmers to become the guardians of our land and really to uptake the efforts for more sustainable agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina, for explaining a bit more to all of us um, what the new CAP is all about. I'll take some of this uh, directly to Ms. Kerper, um, the number of arable birds, are the numbers of arable birds are still decreasing. Um, we've heard CAP has a lot of uh, initiatives, new conditions. Uh, but do you think it will offer enough guarantees or stimuli in order for this f decrease of birds to change? Yes. Um, well, if we start on the positive side, I think we see. Um, that there are more targeted payments for greening in the new cap. Um, and in the Netherlands, for example, we see a growing budget for the agri-environmental schemes in the coming years. 
um, but we are still worried that, uh, well, it's not enough what's now uh, happening, happening in the CAP. It's not only about the area that's focusing, uh, focusing on the agri-environmental schemes. It's also about what's happening on the other 90-95% of the uh, agricultural lands. And um, we, uh, there, were, there are some analyses that show um, that the majority of funding is still going to uh, mainstream agriculture. So we worry that it's not enough, uh, that it's not competi competitive enough uh, with mainstream agriculture to, um, well, restore by the first on a much larger scale. Um, and, well, what we've shown in uh, Partridge uh, has actually strengthened our conviction that more is needed. And I think we already heard some really good advices about how we can improve the agri-environmental schemes, uh, which is a major part, but I also wanted to, well, emphasize that it's also really important that we look at the other 90, 95% of agriculture, what's happening there, and what we're doing with, uh, um, well, reduction of pesticides use or fertilizers um, to, well, restore biodiversity on a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for your experience on the field and talk, um, talking about experience on the field of course we can't do anything else than turn to um, Laurent who really has his daily experience on the field. Can you uh, relate to what Andrea has just said and uh, how you feel about the new possibilities within CAP? I can uh, totally agree with everything that she said. Um, there needs to be an increase of biodiversity, that's true. Um, the only thing that I think, uh, there are a lot of rules that we need also to fo follow. Um, keep it simple for the farmer, keep it possible for the farmer. And also, uh, I know the system in, in Holland, they use a system with metals. If you are doing a lot of good measures, then you improve your payments. And in Belgium, they keep the payments the same. Um, I'm very uh, yeah, happy to take part in the, in the Patrick project. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, the increasing of the biodiversity, that's very important, I understand. Um, but it will be difficult to get all the farmers with the, the same perspective. Uh, if you look just a uh, financial, yeah, uh, good financial person who's looking that he said, I have budget, I want to have 3% of profit. Uh, yeah, at the moment you're working at about 1%. So yeah, it's a, it's a gap between and how you want to convince the, the farmer at, uh, in the future, that will be, uh, I think, a big, uh, yeah, not a problem, but uh, something that you need to keep in mind, yeah. Thank you. You said in the introduction that uh, you took both parts in the Partridge project and the Bespoke project, but uh, now you stop and it was mentioned in uh, one of the presentations before as well. Um, you stop taking part of the Partridge uh, schemes. Uh, I suppose that's because the regulation is too complex or the incentives are too low? Um, so my father started with the project. I was then still on school. It's the first year that I'm fully full time on the farm. Um, but I also see yeah, we, we are farmers to work. I, I started studying farmer to be working on the field, not to work only uh, behind the desk. Uh, the farmers wants to be on the field, need to see on the field what's happening. Uh, we see also, yeah, uh, weeds who are growing on the fields that we need to manage because otherwise we get a, a very angry neighbor. Uh, yeah, the project started in 2016, then we stopped it at 2002. At the end of the project, yeah, we see a lot of weeds. Uh, we can manage it by spraying. That's uh, what's allowed, but in the new, uh, paperwork that we get for the next three years, let's say, there we can read that we cannot anymore use uh, chemical uh, interventions. 
So then we need to, to do it by hand. I don't know if you know spiky plants like distals or something. Yeah. If you need to pull it by hand, it's, it's not so nice. So it must be also, yeah, I think, a very good combination about how you want to keep it going. It must be still practical. Uh, yeah, but I'm still happy about the project. Uh, last six years, I saw a lot. I learned a lot from the fields, what I don't see before. And maybe in the future, if we can pull the demo site a little bit more to our farm, we can start a new project or a new field more narrow to the farm. We already have other pro projects on our own that we started. Uh, 30 years ago, and now you only say, you start to see the profit about it. It's on six years, you cannot make a very big difference. I think we we have 30 years of experience in our farm, and there you have like a, a very big diversity, and you have also the great pages, and you have also uh, hares, and you have also rabbits and ducks and all different species, owls, everything, and. Yeah, it's, you must get a farmer on an, a long term. If it's for three years, I think it's not a possibility. Uh, uh, they start to know the fields after six years, and after six years, yeah, you, 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 you stop the, the project, and it's, again, arable land with, with corn now on the field. So they have nothing at the moment. So yeah, they are lost in the field where they go to. So must think long term. Yeah, and then you must convince the farmer to participate. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll turn to David Scallon from PACE uh, to elaborate a bit more about this. Um, it's perhaps not the... Oh, it's perhaps even a bit provocative to say that uh, not everyone thinks of hunters as uh, nature conservationists, but I can suppose that they have some advantages as a group that we don't know about. So how do you stand in this discussion or how, what opportunities do you see that the new CAP might offer and how hunters can enter the, preser the, the conservation game, so to speak? It's a good question. Um, I think looking at what's happened over recent decades and even going back a little bit longer, the way in which Europe's farming policy has developed, and I'm talking about the cap and its intensification, there's been two big changes for hunters. And one is the, the collapse of biodiversity, in particular farmland biodiversity. I mean, we see the grey partridge, 94% decline since 1980, which is really, really depressing. And it's not just partridge, of course, but it's ground nesting birds. Any birds that are breeding in Europe are, are, are doing badly that we're interested in. Um, and on the other hand, we see a change in ungulates or, or the big game species doing, doing very well. Um, but certainly one of our big threats is the loss of biodiversity. And in the field, hunters are active in terms of creating and managing habitats, in particular for grey partridge. They have a huge interest in the bird because it's it's a game bird. And I think in many of the sites where the partridge is ticking over, it's because of that interest in hunting. And you really need the other pillar as well, which includes um, nest protection, predator management, and the hunting community is also very active there. We have a lot of these projects gathered on biodiversitymanifesto.com. Um, but I think we have another challenge, and that's that's a policy challenge. So I think going back to the comments from um, DG Agri, it's true we have a cap that allows member states to do more for biodiversity than ever before. For example, you can have more ecological features on your farm now without being penalized than before, and that's a very good thing. But very few member states are actually availing of this. You can do some really good things in terms of uh, agri-environmental schemes and under Pillar 1 eco schemes, but there isn't enough environmental ambition at national level. And we get the sense that agricultural ministries are, in, to an extent, maintaining the status quo. Um, the other big opportunity we have in front of us, which is something that we really support, is the new nature restoration regulation. Um, we're talking a lot about 
um, habitat diversity earlier on today, um, and that's a tool that can really deliver results. I think going back to the speaker from ELO this morning and, and also from our, our, our colleague who's a farmer, this needs to be economically feasible land use. So the regulators really need to, to go down the road of making these economically attractive. It's really a people challenge uh, as well. Uh, and we're certainly putting pressure at national level and agricultural ministries to have more ambition in terms of uh, national cap strategic plans. Um, and we're trying in Brussels also to actually have a nature restoration regulation because it's really on a knife edge at the moment. Um, but it's really, I mean, in terms of the publication like this and, and delivering this at the right scale, this is really a mixture of we need some changes in policy, in particular for, for, for the farmer to make this economically attractive. Um, and we also need to move towards environmental ambition or else something bigger will break in the policy uh, debate in the future. So I think we're at a, a nice place to do some good things, in particular with nature restoration. And Europe's hunting community is, is there willing Many of the farmers that invest are also hunters or it's hunters that are pushing farmers to put good biodiversity measures in place. So I think we're a good force for good when it comes to delivering for, uh, well, grey partridge and farmland biodiversity. So, but we need the policy framework to move in this direction as well. Okay, thank you very much. We have um, these specific stakeholders that are mainly aimed at by governments, uh, like, of course, farmers, but also hunters, uh, but there's also the general opinion. And it was al already mentioned uh, during some of the presentations this morning. Um, when you have Mr. Partridge uh, setting the scene, you can immediately think of birds that are quite attractive, um, which one might think it's quite possible to get a general uh, appreciation to do something for these uh, birds. But pollinators, that's something completely different, I think. Uh, so therefore, I turn to Mrs. Fabricius. Uh, the far pollinators, even bees, are far less cuddly for most people. I presume you might think otherwise. But um, as being both a beekeeper and a university, research assistant and one of the Pollinate, uh, Pollinate Sweden um, founders. Perhaps you could elaborate a bit on that. Uh, how do you manage to get the message spread and work on general awareness? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I do think that bees are quite cuddly, actually. <laughs> they are hairy, you see. Bumblebees, I would say, maybe the most uh, you think about when you talk about bees, they are hairy and fluffy and you're attracted to them. Uh, solitary bees are also quite hairy, actually, if you take the time to have a look at them. Honeybees are also a bit hairy, <laughs> maybe not that much, but anyway, they are still hairy and they're very cute when you're just newborn. They are covered with hairs over, uh, on the eyes as well, actually. Um, now, I don't think it's a problem to get um, people to kind of um, feel for, for pollinators because they, the combination of flowers and bees is quite uh, close in our hearts. Uh, and the discussion about the need of pollinators has been increasing and increasing, I would say, for the last like 15 years, actually, since we had a lot of uh, loss of pollinators uh, at that time in the mid of like uh, 2006 or something, which was a big focus from media on losses of honeybees. So it started from the honeybees because it's, it was losses in the US, uh, no honeybees for pollinating of the almond orchards, so no, no crops. So that's what kind of main focus started. And then it continued with the honeybees being like the ambassadors for, for pollinators in general. Uh, and we know about the honeybees quite well. They have also beekeepers that take care of them. Uh, and actually this initiative for Pollinate Sweden, as uh, I mentioned before and you mentioned now, uh, that's when we became aware of that was too much focus on the honeybees. That we have to divide uh, and show how the diversified the pollinators are. Uh, so we moved from just talking about honeybees and trying to explain what act are actually bees. So include bumblebees and solitary bees and the different need of these bees. 
so that's why we've tried to raise awareness about the complexity, so it's not only about honeybees. And now I would say the discussion maybe have been a bit reversed. So now we think we have too many honeybees because there are not enough food, not enough flowers for all the pollinators. So that's another discussion. Uh, and in Sweden we have uh, produced some manuals actually for beekeepers to uh, how we can think about where we are placing the honeybees. Um, maybe not everywhere is suitable because there need to be, of course, food enough for the wild bees as, at the same time. Um, so I would say it's not a problem to talk about the pollinators. It's a general opinion and the awareness has been increasing a lot. So many people are interested in doing something for, for wild bees and honeybees as well, of course. Then. Thank you very much for making that this a bit more clear for us. Um, I think I dare say that, uh, Mr. Leung, you as a social scientist, it feels a bit, you feel to me a bit as the odd man out in this panel, uh, but yet getting everyone on board uh, and get this general awareness as well as uh, the awareness from the stakeholders a bit higher is... Uh, exactly why social sciences might uh, play an important role, I presume. So perhaps you could enlighten us a bit more about the research you did and are doing, and more specifically in the Beef Spilt project. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's, it will be a very short and brief <laughs> kind of explanation. And as you all understand, in social science, we have a lot of different directions, and my focus is communication science. So I work with how to create learning processes among, especially then, farmers uh, in different ways. And that's, of course, then uh, related to what we did also in, in Bespoke. Um, but I think what I would like to do in a way in relation to Bespoke is to reflect upon what's actually been said a bit, because uh, we, when working with farmers and looking at each individual farmer, what's, what's kind of bottlenecks they have, you realize quite soon that no chain is stronger than the weakest link. So for each individual person, there will be something that will hinder them to change, for instance, or implement a specific measure. And Ronald, you've mentioned a lot of these potential hindrances. And those hindrances for some farmers might be on a, on a very individual level. It could be the, the knowledge level. It could be attitudes that you have, uh, how you look at authority initiatives, you know, if you want to be self uh, co in control of yourself and your development, not engaged in policy programs, etc. But then you have the societal level, of course, that you can look at, you know, the, how flexible or simple the systems, the policy systems are and incentives, and whether or not you have uh, funding pot potentials, etc. So the point is, when we look at these uh, uh, ambitions that we have now from going from these good examples, the demo sites that we have, and remember that those demo sites have been working in these processes for some years often. So is there a quick fix? Is it something that makes other farmers and the other growers to do this uh, change as the demo sites have done quicker? I would say in general, no. So then the question comes, how can you develop a policy system that enable farmers uh, in, in, in line with their own kind of uh, preconditions to develop in this direction? Because what we've seen in research is that they're not negative to biodiversity. Of course, it's, it's something very, very positive for almost all farmers. So the question is rather, how can you look at each situation and see how these different hindrances can be taken away? And finally, then, then connect that to the Bespoke project, and I think also to the Partridge, is that uh, what's, what's really nice with these projects is that they have this broad communication strategy. They look both at how to create a general awareness, a lot of publications, a lot of nice homepages and, and, and tools, but they also work with the, um, on the farm level, field level, with advisory services, how to de develop those methods and be innovative. And they have this kind of policy recommendation level too. So I think the challenge for us in projects, as well as in, in developing the, the uh, the whole policy system is actually to find measures that can help us on all levels at the same time. It doesn't decrease complexity, but it makes us understand that we have to manage complexity. That's the challenge, kind of. Thank you very much. Um, I thought 
there was a connection uh, or we, we heard same things getting back uh, what Laurent has, has already um, uh, related to about, for instance, that uh, a project of three years is too, too short um, and this complexity that should be um, dealt with. Uh, perhaps, Laurent, you can um, give us some examples of how the bespoke or the Partridge pro project um, helped you to obtain more knowledge. Um, what were the new things you've learned or ha did you see uh, a change of uh, in reaction of the people around you? Uh. Uh, let's say um, the, the project himself was because we, we, we started it because we had interest in it. Uh, we are farmers, we are hunters also, so we like also to see the, the animals on the field. Um, and that was a good combination at the time, 2016, we started the project because the prices of the agriculture uh, crops were very low. Uh, it was about the same payment that you earned from the project of for the crops that you harvested from the fields. Now there is an increase of the prices of everything. So then the farmers started to yeah, um, yeah, change the, their minds. Uh, yeah, we don't have the big profit that we had in the time that we had in 2016. The difference is too big. Um, we look to another point of it. Um, the, 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 the payment is also important, but we combined it, the, the, the projects with our, uh, our global look on the farm. Uh, we don't only look to the payments, we don't look only to the, the, the animals, we look also to people who drive by with the bike. Uh, was a good combination. People see our farm. They uh, they open their eyes and said, "Oh, they they think also global. They think responsibility. They take responsibility for nature. They don't only take, think about profit. To make a business model out of it, it's difficult because you cannot say to a fabric, ah, I plant flower blocks. Uh, uh, it's very good for the for the nature. Uh, they don't look to it. They only look to the product." Some companies started to change. They hook on the, 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 the let's say, the, the, the change. They also see that it's needed for more uh, biodiversity. So they say, ah, we must also hook on the, the trailer and we must connect to this uh, system. Uh, so we must combine it. Uh, we must give a reward for the farmer that they have more payments on their crop for the things that they do on the field, the management that they do on the field. Uh, we also see it, we like it also, we also see the effect. We see a lot of insects, good insects, we see a lot of flowers, big uh, butterflies that I never see before. My father talked to me about 10 years ago, I never seen, but in the Patrick project I saw them and I was like, whoa, that's, the effect is, is, is real. And if you can bring this to the, the people and to the producers from uh, our area, we, we produce the food, but we, we, we sell it to the, the, the industry who makes uh, the final product of it. So then we must yeah, find some combination how we can connect this and make like the system in Holland, the metals, uh, you put uh, for yourself uh, the, the, the effort to connect in the, in the farming industry and you combine it with the, the sustainable farming with uh, the flower blocks and the beetle banks and everything, then you must have the profit about it. But that's the only thing that's now at the moment you get a payment and that's, all, that's it. And if you do more efforts, you, you, you see it. You, we also had very dry years. Then we looked, ah, you see the, the flower block. We, we once go over it with a heavy machine to close the ground very good, that the seeds are not drying out. So we do extra efforts to make the, the results much more, much higher. I'm, I'm, I'm a very basic farmer, but I think it's, it's very important to make it clear that farmers want to participate, but it must make a, a, a bigger thing from everything. So the payments, 
are important, but we must hook it on the 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 the, the, the selling. Uh, you you have good points. You have from your area like this space that you invested or committed to uh, biodiversity. You can hook it on your trailer and say, ah, I have this with me. Uh, how can we make some business model about it? That's that's a diff difficult thing about the the. Um, the the, uh, the projects for me, yeah, you have only the project, uh, the the payments. You cannot put it in non-profit elements because you get a payment from it. So you have already a very big surface. Normally, we we looked on the in the beginning of the year to fill all the paperwork in, and we just reach the non-profit arable. And then you say, how oh, it's possible? It's uh, we already do this, 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 but I uh, this count. You already get payment for it. So that's, uh, let's say, a coin on two sides. You want to participate, but on the other side, it's don't bring a profit to, to your company. And I think there they need to do something with it. Yeah. Thank you. I see Marina writing and writing, <laughs> <laughs> taking down all the suggestions. To, um, perhaps about... Um, the learning and the sharing of knowledge. Um, there's something that was already mentioned in the presentation before, but I would like to uh, get back to it. In the Bespoke project, there's a model developed by the University of Ghent in which farmers can learn which pollinators are useful or beneficial for their crops and which flowers can be most helpful to attract that specific kind of pollinators. So perhaps, um, uh, Ms. Fabricius, I turn to you once again. Um, <coughs> perhaps you can say something about it or tell us something more about the different roles of wild bees and honeybees, how they are both necessary for, for good pollination. Because it came across already, but I think it's something that is not widely known yet. Yes, thank you. I, <clears throat> I think we can look at it, if I take it then from the beekeeper's perspective and the honeybees, then they fly out in an area about three kilometers. And in that area, they forage for food. That's in the flowers, pollen and nectar. So they can cover a quite a big area. Uh, and that is actually 28 square kilometers. And as a beekeeper, and you need to be aware of what is happening in this area to provide a secure food or a, a good uh, foraging area for the honeybees. If we then go to the bumblebees, they also go quite far, maybe a couple of kil kilometers, but stay closer to home. And for the solitary bees, only uh, maybe 100 meters, uh, like we talked about before. And so every one of these species, they need to have the food close to where they stay. Uh, and as a beekeeper, you can be responsible for uh, maybe be the collective force in that area, talking to land managers and talk about what kind of measures are taken for pollinators or others, other things to see that this landscape is more um, in a holistic way uh, good for pollinators and how we can work together. And that's also about connectivity because it's usually more than one farmer. I'm not sure if it's everywhere, but usually more than one farmer in 28 square kilometers. Uh, and we need to collaborate in a good way for that. Okay, I think, uh, thank you for elaborating on that. Um, I suppose that's for Laurent's farm won't be a problem as they have a big cherry orchard and lots of uh, bees and pollinators uh, flying around there. Um, but do you think um, that there's perspective uh, for farmers to have to be able to use a tool like this, that they can uh, adjust flower seeds, flower beds according to the crops they have. Do you think it might convince farmers to uh, take up more AES? Um, I think yes, because this spring I already see it. Um, Around our orchard, we had a flower block bespoke, and it was very wet, very cold. We had honeybees from a honeybee keeper who put them always in the spring there for a pollution of the blossom. 
and yeah, the, the, the honeybees were not flying. What's the cold? So we already were very afraid about production for this year. We, we, we see it also. But next to it is the honey, is the, 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 the bespoke flower block. So there we had the wild bees, the solitary bees, the bumblebees, and they can do the pollution of the, the blossom. So I think, yeah, it must be to convince the, the farmers more and more to do this is to have good com uh, documentation about it, make them aware of it. Uh, there are also bat insects who can uh, grow inside the bespoke project. Uh, little flies, we have also problems with, with flies who uh, infect the fruit in season. That they also, uh, it, yeah, they also grow in the, in the, honey, in the bespoke project. So I think that it's, it's, it's important to, yeah, that you have the different mixes where you can attract different species. That's the one uh, thing that needs to be very clear. Then the second one is, yeah, the advice from people who know something about the, the, the insects, that they can bring it over to the, the farmer, that they are aware of, ah, this is possible, this is possible. Um, then I think you will have more farmers who will participate, because I see already the effect. We, we, we combine it to the selling that we do. We, we sell everything at home, our fruit, and we can say, ah, we have natural uh, insects who predate the, the bat insects, and that's a kind of selling point again. We, we try to combine everything, the, the bespoke project with the farming, with the social aspect, with the selling aspect, and then you get a very good, uh, yeah, a strong combination to make a business model. And for uh, farmers, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing to, to mind, to, 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 let's say, the farmers uh, make aware of it. And, uh, yeah, I think we need to go to this because we have less products, we have more bioproducts for spraying, so we already grow to it. But it's only the, the way how it's bring to the farmer that they can, yeah, uh, manage it, yeah. I think we have lots and lots more to talk about, but far too little time. Um, I'll just turn back for a question to Mrs. Hagiani. Do you think that um, CAP is already flexible enough and offering uh, enough possibilities for farmers to uh, have tailor-made and organizations to have tailor-made solutions for providing more biodiversity, or do you take some of these uh, um, suggestions into account to work further on them? Well, I will try to be really short. Uh, I mean, one of the main priorities, I think, of the new CAP was really to give much more flexibility to the member states to design their own interventions by taking into account their local needs and local context. We have really tried a lot not to give uh, detailed rules that go at the beneficiary level in the EU framework and really try to uh, provide as much as subsidiarity as possible to the member states to really set up their own CAP strategic plans and uh, their own schemes. Um, so when it comes to the farmers' choices, Yes, I really think that farmers have the choices. I mean, uh, of course, when it comes to the advice, we also have to uh, do a bit of work and improvement on that, uh, for sure. Uh, but I mean, we are really still in a very, I will say, uh, preliminary stage. The Kaplans have been up and running since Jagani. So it's quite early to draw conclusions uh, and lessons learned from now. I think we need to give it a bit of more time to see how the new CAP is actually working on the ground. Uh, we are also into continuous discussion and exchange with the member states to see what is working and what is not, which intervention is performing and which is not. So uh, we have all these mechanisms and all these tools in place uh, to provide them flexibility and also to be able to adapt in case something is not working. 
Okay, thank you very much. I just wanted I just look at uh, wanted to ask whether there are questions from the public. We have not that much time, but <laughs> we'll try to squeeze in at least some of them. I'll go right at the back. Valentina Sidi from FACE. I said thank you for the interesting panel discussion. I have a question for the European Commission official about uh, CAP strategic plans with regards to uh, monitoring and reporting obligations for member states. She said it's too early, of course, to draw conclusions, but I would like to know um, when actually member states have uh, to report on CAP strategic plans. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. I mean, it's a quite complex system that we have in place. But I mean, uh, what I can explain very simply and in this very short time we have is that the member states have to be reporting on an annual basis whether they are achieving their annual milestones that they have set and also uh, how they are actually progressing in achieving the results uh, that they have actually established in their cap plans. So this is an annual application from the member states. And when we see that there is uh, underperformance or they are not achieving their milestones, then we will be discussing with them and we may actually ask them to draw action plans in order to bring performance back in place. So we have a common framework of the different output result and impact indicators, and this is what all member states have to be using in order to be reporting back to us. Then we had someone, yeah. So. Hello. I have a question uh, to the Commission. Uh, because the farmers and foresters are the key players in, in supporting biodiversity, uh, and our issue here is how to change their state of mind in the long term. When we talk about the pollinators, patrich, loss of biodiversity, in fact, we talk also about providing food in the long term. Why? Because there, all these aspects are, in fact, all behind the problem which we see, but we don't talk about. It is the soil degradation, the loss of fertility of soil. In fact, all we do in the Patridge project, in the pollinator project, project, in protecting biodiversity, is also to protect the soil fertility. I think it should be in future the key issue because it unites the point of view of all stakeholders, even the final consumers who don't think about it, but they have to get food and you cannot get food without soil. And I think it should be in the center of the cup in future. What, do you have any plans to monitor the soil quality uh, from this point of view? Thank you. Well, I'm unfortunately not the soil expert, but I mean, we definitely have somebody in our unit who is dealing with that. But what I can say is that definitely soil is also part of one of the objectives of the Kaplans. Uh, and we also have the recent soil health law, uh, which will actually be uh, used for the member states. But I cannot give more information because I'm not the expert. But definitely soil is definitely something that uh, we are closely looking at. And I think this is something what farmers will understand easily, that this is their job. And then we take a last question, a quick one or a short one. It's going to be a very short one. I, I have a okay. thousand questions to do, but I, I'm going to make just one. But it's, it's going to be very clear. Uh, my question is for the European Commission official. Uh, I don't know if, he, if you are aware what is happening in the south of Europe because the, of the lack of rain this year we are harvesting at any time, which means we are killing thousands of birds that are nesting in the, in the ground. And nobody cares. We have declared the little buster in, in danger, is, is in, in danger of extinction. And nobody is asking what is happening with him. If you kill one mm, little buster by accident with, uh, with a falcon, I, I'm a falconer, you, you can go in jail. But instead, if a, if a farmer kills a thousand of nests, doesn't matter because it's legal. You can harvest at any time, at any place, whatever they want. They are even harvesting at night. So what's the point about this, of the new cap? What what's your, is your opinion on how it's going to be in the future? It's going to be the same because if we are working about to preserve these kind of birds, we, we cannot do anything else if it's going to be still legal. Thank you. 
Well, I can say that we really care. <laughs> so if I can start like that. Um, but indeed, I mean, when it comes to checking whether the farmers and the cap beneficiaries are compliant with all their obligations, this is really at the member states, uh, national authorities, that they have to carry out these checks. Uh, and because they cannot pay, of course, the farmers if they are not complying with the different commitments and obligations they have. If farmers are non-compliant, then they will not be receiving the CAP funds. What we are doing from the Commission side is that we are actually checking that the Member States are carrying out these checks. So we are at a secondary level of controls to the Member States, but we are not them ourselves that going and check the beneficiaries at uh, the national level. But of course, if, as, I, as I said, if there are non-compliances, I mean, these have to be really drawn to the attention of the national authorities, and those farmers should not be paid. Thank you. Then we will end this panel discussion here, but I want to give a last word to all of the panelists, if they can just convey to the audience in one, just one or two sentences, what is the key message that you want everyone here to remember and take home with them. Uh, perhaps I'll start with Ms. Hatiani. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think we, we all recognize that if we have no biodiversity and no pollinators, then we cannot have agriculture and we cannot produce our food. Uh, we are really in the very same line on that, and that's exactly why we are trying so much also to make our agriculture much more sustainable. Uh, as I mentioned, we have now our new cap. We need to give it some time to be running and to start drawing conclusions. But what I want to highlight is that uh, we really have to strike the right balance. I think that's the most challenging thing of all. We need to provide the right compensation to the farmers, but we also need to bring uh, nature back to agriculture. So we need to find the right, I would say, uh, way on how to achieve this. Thank you very much. So I think um, Habitat, we need to put on a plate um, good agri-environmental packages for grey partridge. Uh, we have the science and partridge project has, has shown this. Um, in a way, I think member states also have a legal obligation to look after their grey partridge and in some ways it's a bit frustrating that infringements can be directed left, right and centre but there needs to be a bit more action within DG Envy, I think DG Agri too about are we just going to let birds like the grey partridge go extinct? Um, and I think farm advisors, in many cases, um, there needs to be a program so farm advisors can really get with the program because sometimes there's a lack of ambition and sometimes there's do the easy things uh, to maintain the status quo. But the one big thing to take away at this point, I think in European history, is the nature restoration law. That's something that can really deliver and our plea to decision makers is to really support this. This will be good for uh, nature and, and good for long-term resilience, also food production. Yes. <clears throat> then I would like to add to you to your discussion that we have to have these local conditions and the local solutions very close at hand, because there are no solutions fitting everyone. So we need to adapt to that and provide a big toolbox with supportive structures for all the ones uh, managing land in different ways. Um, and by doing that, also um, help and take measures pr beneficial for pollinators and for us and for the food production, because the pollinators and the wildlife belongs also in the managed land areas and it should be able it should be possible to combine uh, food production and or at the same time um, help the, the wildlife and pollinators and the parties of course into that uh, just to start i fully uh, support a plea for us for an ambition uh, nature restoration plan and i think partridge uh, showed us that we need a huge surface uh, area for wildlife conservation um, and if we want to restore bird populations and biodiversity in general uh, we need an approach on landscape scale and 
in general, we just need better and more effective habitat measures. And we need more farmers in concentrated areas to participate and cooperate. And therefore, we need more budget and competitive agri-environmental schemes. Um, and I think one of the major key is the collaboration with all the stakeholders. And if you have a common goal and a plan, you can achieve much if you, uh, if you put your mind to it. And um, um, so that's, for me, the main take-home message. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, a bit to build on that, perhaps. I think what I can add is that uh, we need a strong vision, in a way, uh, which then is, of course, reflected in a lot of the existing policies. That has to be kept in mind. But in, in, in line with that, I think also that the approach uh, on, on uh, uh, general level w must be the kind of simple and flexible solution. But having said that, I think it's important to, in a way, refocus funding to support uh, um, other kinds of advisory services than we have today. It's, it's still very, very expert-oriented, expert and the whole uh, education system is, is in that direction too. So what we've seen is that we need other kinds of advisors that could uh, lead processes of change and create these kind of networks, facilitate innovation, etc. But within the context of simple and flexible frameworks, because that's necessary in order to actually find these kind of local adapted solutions. So it, it's both keep, it's, it's keeping a lot of thoughts in mind at the same time: a strong vision, simple, flexible policy context, and then uh, working on the ground with the local networks and and, and farmers. Me as a young farmer, we, I only can say that we are ambitious as farmers to participate in this everything. Um, the only thing that I ask is to keep the, the rules simple and clear for everybody in the union the same. Then you take everywhere the same arable land for biodiversity and then it's for everybody an, uh, an equal uh, story, that there is no concurrence, that not only one farmer need to do all the, the efforts to make it uh, possible. Um, yeah, I think for some farmers that already hooked off the trailer, it's five past twelve, so don't make it worse and push them more away. Take them as a friend in the, in the, in the, in the system. Um, take them with the, the system, let's say, how must I say it, um, participate them in the system, let them feel that they have profit, can have profit about it, not only a payment, but so much more, and then you will have far more bad results in long term, not in short term. Thank you all for your contribution. Thanks the audience for listening in and asking questions. Um, we will, I will first let the panelists uh, leave this platform and then we will hear the last speaker of this morning's event. <coughs>
So congratulations to those of you in the room who are part of these teams for this wonderful work. And to those of us like me who are not part of these projects, there is a great deal of material here to delve into. I really encourage you to get to grips with these materials and these products and these projects and disseminate them as much as you can. So, but very briefly to summarize the key messages. How do we do more and better? Firstly, these projects have shown clearly that we need enough habitat on our farmlands, 10%. Clearly showed, uh, there's clear scientific evidence for this increase of 4.5% in high quality habitat on top of what was already there. The bumblebees have responded quickly, clearly shown at the local level. These are key pollinators. We need to keep in mind that the rare and specialized species will need more. They'll need large areas of flower-rich grassland. And the bird populations were stabilized, a big achievement. But clearly, birds need action across the landscape. So how can we create incentives for farmers to work to create these habitat networks at the landscape level? We've heard about new eco-schemes, which are uh, an important innovation in the new cap and have the potential to go far. And some member states have taken an approach where farmers can stack actions, um, where there's a bonus for um, a farmer to connect habitat with neighbors. Wallonia has that approach. And others that are um, mapping habitat creation to make sure that it forms a network there are lessons that we can learn from these eco-schemes and from attempts, also ones that maybe are not working as intended. Why not? We need to scale up and we need to connect. We need more farmers in agri-environments. Some member states have a high uptake, but in some areas we've heard that farmers still don't have a any idea of what agri-environment options are available and they're not interested. The survey of, um, is really important, brings in some um, key messages on how to do this better. We need a good package of actions in a broad agri-environment targeted at farmers in these, um, with, in these cropland landscapes. And we have the recipe here. We also need to recognize um, ambition, those farmers who want to go further. Denmark, for example, in its eco-scheme, is providing for farmers who want to provide those larger blocks of habitats. They can do that and get recognized for it. Multidisciplinarity was a key message, and I take this further to say that this needs <coughs> cooperation. Um, the key word was relationships based on trust. Networks where farmers can interact with, um, with, the, with researchers, with hunters, with volunteers, with environmental groups. These are possible under the cap, but they need funding through the cooperation measure. They, we need m many more innovation pilots, which can be done with cap money. And of course, we, um, we have the leader groups, which are often not profiled in this, but which could do a lot more here. And we have um, member states who are taking big strides to set up locally managed agri-environment um, schemes. For example, um, Ireland has taken a big jump here and they have now eight big areas that are implementing results-based agri-environment schemes with teams of trained um, uh, experts and advisors going to those farmers on-farm advice with a farmer who walks around the farm with the advisor and scores habitat criteria so that it's a mutual learning process and the farmer can clearly see what options they have for their farm and where they're really creating high quality value. We heard from the farmer about how these, <clears throat> these uh, relationships and networks can build um, opportunities for new um, for new business opportunities and what's needed. It's not just to create a, a matter of networks, it needs more, but also that people see our farm. There's a, a, a local recognition there. Sorry, <clears throat> I need to stop because my voice is telling me. <laughs> the last point was flexibility. Um, 
no arbitrary rules, but the scope for farmers to be able to address their um, farm management problems if they need to, and also scope for longer contracts or arrangements and shorter entry level sort of step in lower risk opportunities for farmers coming into this. The results based approach is, um, is also again really key here. It's a way in which to reward farmers for really producing the biodiversity but giving them at the same time more flexibility in using their skills and their situation to figure out the best way of doing that. Enough said, because there's plenty that I could say here. For my three final messages before lunch, I'd like to um, <clears throat> come back to the um, woman from DG Agri. This is the first year of the new CAP plans. There is a lot that has changed, and this is a learning uh, year. There's um, opportunity next year to really build on what has worked, improve what's not working, and to really scale up this advice and these mutual learning opportunities that are needed. There are many good schemes in the new CAP plans that have tiny budgets and very, very unambitious target areas. It's now up to us to show what is working and where these really, really need to um, be much more ambitious. Secondly, for Interreg, I would like to praise Interreg Northeast Region for taking up these two projects. And I would like to see uh, a lot more agriculture and biodiversity projects funded by the Interreg program. We know, looking at the biodiversity funding needs that uh, that are required in the, to meet our 2030 targets. The CAP has a lot that it needs to deliver, but the CAP is no longer enough. The regional development funds really have a crucial role here, and the biodiversity spending target is not being met for 2026, and there's a key role here for Interreg. In case anyone from regional development is in the room today. <laughs> Finally, um, I would like to um, echo the message about the nature restoration law. This is not a law that is an additional burden on farmers. It is an opportunity for farmers to get the support that they need from the member states to deliver these targets and at the same time to adapt to the pressures of climate change on their farms. We've seen the impact that drought is having in southern Spain. The kinds of measures that are in these packages for pollinators and birds, these also have a crucial role for climate adaptation on farm. And the um, nature restoration law puts binding, legally binding targets on the EU and the member states, but how these go down to farmer level is, um, is all about um, incentives and support packages um, and enabling measures. And now I wish you a, a great lunch and fruitful discussions. Thank you. So dear audience, now we really are at the formal end of our meeting. Thank you for being here with us, uh, both here and online, in, um, and being so attentive. We appreciate that very much. Um, a big thank you as well for VLIVA that has been very supportive in organizing this event and uh, for the Committee of the Regions for receiving us here today and offering technical support. The lunch will uh, take part in... Oh, yeah, perhaps you've all seen it on the screen already. There's uh, another question from menti.com. You might fill in uh, while I'm saying the last things. Um, and I'm just looking around where... Yvonne Meus is, yeah, could you, yeah, just wave your hand or stand up. If uh, people want to know more about the pollinator model that uh, the university has developed, uh, he will be present during lunch and the network to learn all about it or to give you more uh, information on it. Um, don't forget anything here in this room as we move to the sixth floor uh, by using the elevator and then I wish you all a lovely lunch, so it's at the end of the corner.